There are two passages of scripture we're going to walk through very quickly in this last session. Life-changing scriptures, to say the least. It opens like this, and this alone gets my attention. Luke 18, verse 1. Listen to how it opens. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show them that they should always pray and never give up. Stop right there. Wow. Does that summarize a lot of what we're talking about today? Jesus told his disciples, he's going to teach them with a story, how he wants them to pray, what he wants prayer to look like. And I love the part that he added, to pray and never give up. So he's going to give us himself, Jesus himself is going to give us a lesson on prayer by giving us this illustration. Now let me add to this. There are so many illustrations he could have given when it, as it pertains to prayer. He could have given us, an because there's so many forms of prayer, there's so many ways to pray, he could have given us a, an illustration of someone that's just sitting quietly and drinking their coffee and praying, and, and that's fine, and I do that too sometimes. But that could have been our great illustration of how to pray. But of all the ones he could have chosen, this is the, cho this is the story he chose to say, this is what I want prayer to look like. You ready? Here's what he says. Verse 2. There was a judge in a certain city who neither feared God or cared about people. A widow in that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. Watch this. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Now, just stop right there. What in the world? This is how Jesus is saying prayer is supposed to look like. A woman, I kind of like it that it's a woman, I've got to admit, yes. A woman that is approaching this judge that does not care, fear God or care about people, and she's saying, he says she's coming constantly. There's something right there for you to learn. When you're believing God for something in prayer, it's not a matter of just praying one time about it. He is showing us here, she's coming constantly every day, every day, every day. She is there before that unjust judge. Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. I love that because that's how I felt when I was contending for my daughter. It's how I still feel right now about some things I'm contending for. The devil's come in my house, robbed me of some things right now, and I'm approaching God just like that woman. Give me justice in my dispute with the devil. Give me justice in this dispute with the devil. That's what he's saying. And he's saying just keep on. Now look at the illustration of how, she's, how you're supposed to look in prayer. He says, the judge is saying, I don't fear God or care about people, but I'm going to give her what she wants because, watch, she's driving me crazy with her constant request. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out. <laughs> really? That's... God is saying, you need to look like you're just wearing him out, just wearing God out, just constantly. Just like, and excuse the phrase because it's impossible, but like just driving him crazy. That's impossible to do. But that's the illustration here. Like you're almost annoying. Now, you would never be annoying to God, but that's the approach. In other words, I'm just going to keep on. If I don't get my answer today, I'm coming back tomorrow. If it ain't tomorrow, I'll be back the next day. And if it's not six months, I'll be back the next day. I'm every day. Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. My voice is going to be heard in heaven. I'm praying your will. I'm praying your word over this thing. Now, this is my favorite part. Listen to this. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God... 
will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. And when the Son of Man comes, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? I love that. I love it that Jesus says, listen, learn a, learn a lesson from him. If he would answer her and give her a just answer, he doesn't even fear God. Don't you think God will surely give justice to you, his sons and daughters who come to him? I love that. Day and night. Day and night. Then I love it when he says, I tell you, he will give them justice and he will give it to them speedily. In other words, when, you, when, he, when he does answer you, it may seem like it's taking forever for him to answer you. But what, because you know, you, some people look at that and they think, well, it ain't speedily. I've been here for three years and it ain't happened. It's not, he ain't giving me. No, what it means, honey, is that when he does come with your answer, it's going to be so fast your head's going to spin. He's going to hit you like a Boom! He's going to hit you. Your whole family is going to go, what just happened? I mean, when he comes, it's going to be a rush. Hallelujah. And nothing's going to stop him. When he answers you, he's going to answer you speedily. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Glory to God. Never give up. He said, never give up. You know why? Because you can give up. Some people have given up and just, they don't even know it. Some people have given up, don't know they've given up. They've just developed a theology that makes them feel justified in quitting. A lot of people have given up, they don't know it, they just say, I'm just waiting on God. And it just sounds good, but there's no faith in it. Sometimes you've given up, you don't realize you've given up. And you use phrases like that because it still makes you sound like you're in it. I'm just waiting on God. Well, honey, waiting on God is necessary. But waiting on God is not passive. Waiting on God does not look like you ain't praying. You asked seven years ago. You ain't prayed about it since. He didn't answer then. Somebody asked you about it. I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, honey. Waiting on God is one of the most spiritually aggressive things you can do. We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass. At just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high-quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. Waiting on God looks like, and Bob Sorge said this, waiting on God looks like doing whatever it takes to stay in faith. That's what waiting on God looks like. Waiting on God looks like I've asked him. I don't have the answer yet, but I'm waiting on him. So while I'm waiting on him, I'm going to be fasting. Come on. Because when I begin to fast, it begins to accelerate things in the spirit realm. So I'm, I'm waiting on God, but I'm fasting and I'm praying. Waiting on God doesn't look like I'm just waiting. Waiting on God looks like he's coming. Is today the day? Come on. Waiting on God looks like I've already got his word. I know he's on his way. Come on. Is he here yet? No? Okay, he'll be here. He'll be here. That's what waiting on God looks like. I know he's coming. Come on, if people look at you and your family, they say, you're crazy. You've been praying about this seven years. That's right, and I'll be here tomorrow. He may, he's probably going to come today because I know I've already got his word. He's coming. I know he's coming. That's what I know. I know he gave me his word. He'll be here because he don't break his promises. I'm waiting on him. That's right. I'm waiting on him because I know he'll be here. I know he'll be here. Come on, that's what waiting on God looks like. Say, I know he's coming. I know he'll keep his word. Hallelujah. 
You got to keep faith in the game. You got to keep faith in this. You never give it up. One more scripture. I'm going to close with this one for our session today. This one is just amazing. Luke chapter 11. Two places in the book of Luke, Jesus gives specific teaching and examples on how to pray. And it's beautiful because his disciples more than once ask Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. You know why they ask that? Because they had heard him praying. Can you imagine what that would have been like to have walked close enough with him that when he wandered off by himself through the trees a little ways away from them, they still gathered up close enough. I'd love to have heard the disciples' conversations. They'd never heard anybody pray like that. They had never heard anybody pray like him. He didn't just pray. He prayed all kinds of ways of praying, which alone in itself is amazing that Jesus, God with skin on, Son of God, would find it necessary to pray. Servant's not greater than his master. If he thought it was necessary to pray, do you reckon we, we need to pray? He prayed all night long before he ever picked his disciples. All night. Jesus prayed all night, more than once. He only had three and a half years of ministry. Only had three and a half years of doing his ministry. It looks like he'd have been like, you know, I don't have much time here. I don't have a lot of time to pray. He could have said, you have only got three and a half years. Ministry is all consuming. It's just so busy. It just consumes me. I don't have a lot of time for prayer. He knew it was necessary enough. He had to have it. In, in, in Hebrews, I'm going to have to bypass because I heard a verse. Hebrews 5 and 7, look at this verse. It says, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Wow. It says, while Jesus was on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings. Did you see that? With a loud cry and tears. I'm sure Jesus prayed every way there was, quiet prayers, con you know, conversational prayers, but there was sometimes he prayed loud prayers. You should too. You should too. You should go off by yourself sometime. Pray out loud. Jesus prayed loud enough that those disciples were so moved by his prayers, it rocked their world. They'd been raised in the temple. They'd heard rabbis pray. They'd heard these great priests pray. But when he finished praying, they said, teach us to pray. So that's what he did. Luke 11, verse 1. So Jesus, when he was in a certain place praying, as he finished praying, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples, and Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And he gives them the beautiful prayer that we know is the Lord's Prayer. Lord, Father which is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's skip down to verse 5. Verse 5 says, and then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Please listen very carefully to this story, all right? Again, of all the stories he could have told, this is the one he chose. So he said, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door's locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this. Watch, please, if he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need. Watch, because of your shameless persistence. 
That's amazing. So I tell you, keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Oh, my. Yes, give the Lord. Thanks. Bob Sorge wrote an amazing book that rocked my world. It's called Illegal Prayers. And uh, he lays out this story, bases a lot of his book on this story. And in his book, he lays out an illustration of that story that I thought was so fascinating. I want to share it with you because it just helps us to take a story from the Bible times and the, in Jesus' illustration without changing at all its meaning. We can just pull it into our world and get the real revelation of what God is trying to say to us about how he wants us to pray. Okay? It's, it's incredible that, he's, that that little phrase right there, if he won't do it for friendship's sake, He'll get up and give you what you want because of your shameless persistence. In other words, just gall. If you, if, go, go look at the interpretation of that, shameless persistence. It means just gall to just keep on. That's how Jesus said, this is how you pray. <laughs> wow. It's a lot different than a lot of way we think prayer looks like. Much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW, 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37312. Thank you. God bless you and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. So you got this man. You got three men in this story basically. And we're going to name these men Dave, Jim, and Rick, all right? Now, Dave and Jim both live in Dallas. They are very good friends. And, uh, but also, Jim has a friend who lives in St. Louis. And that guy in St. Louis's name is Rick. And um, one particular night, what happened was Jim and Dave... Uh, were visiting. D Jim was over at Dave's house. They were having dinner. J uh, Jim brought the whole family over there, and, and uh, they were, the whole family was friends, and so was Dave and his kids. And they all had a great dinner and everything, enjoyed the, the dinner together. And, and they finally got through eating, and uh, they went on home late, and everybody was getting on bed. But what happened was, what Jim didn't know was that Rick in St. Louis was actually driving down to Houston. But he, he was coming through Dallas, and uh, Rick got to getting tired and just thought, you know, I just don't think I can make a trip to Houston. He says, I'm going to have to stop over in, in Dallas, and I think I'll have to spend the night. He's just too tired to make the trip. Oh, yeah, I remember. I remember. I got Jim. Jim lives in Dallas. I bet you he'd let me stay at his house tonight. So what he does is uh, Rick goes over to Jim's house. Now, it's late. It's, it's, it's almost it's about midnight right now, and, uh, you know, Jim and his family is already actually in bed, but... Rick knocks on the door and Jim gets up. And now, according to Bible days and in the Jewish uh, hospitality, you know, in those days, people would make on over a company like that. And you'd bring all the family out. And you'd bring the kids out. And you'd bring food out no matter what time. It was just their way. And so that's kind of illustrated here. So, uh, you know, Rick is at the door. Jim answers the door. And even though Jim's kind of tired, he's, oh! Oh, Rick, hey, good to see you. Didn't expect to see you here tonight. What are you doing? Rick's telling him, I was just driving in. I was just so tired. I don't think I can make the trip. I was just wondering if I could just stay over at your house. and Me and my family, if you mind, if we just spent the night. Well, Jim's going, of course you can. <laughs> Honey, 
I got company. We got company. Y'all get up. Everybody get up. Sweetheart, we got uh, Rick and all his family's here. Y'all just sit down. Everybody, I bet you're hungry. You hungry? We'll get you something out of the kitchen right now. Let me go in there. We're going to fix you some dinner. Get the kids settled. Me, me and my wife here, we're going to go in the kitchen and get you something to eat. Glad y'all came. So good to see y'all. Y'all make yourself at home. And Jim goes in the kitchen, and his wife looks at him and says, Jim, you know we are out of everything. We don't even have bread in this house. He says, I know it, I know it, but what else could I say? I, 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 she, I don't know what to feed them. Jim says, you know what? Tonight when we were over at Dave's house eating dinner, I saw Dave put three loaves of bread in that pantry. They've got some food left over from dinner tonight. I'll just run over to Dave's house and get some food, get some bread. I'll just be back in a little while. You stay in there and entertain them, and I'll be back in just a few minutes. So Jim heads over to Dave's house. So what happens is he runs across town, right across town, back to Dave's house. By this time, it's, it is midnight. But you know what happens, obviously, uh, Jim and Dave, good friends, so it won't matter. Dave. 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 Hey, Dave, listen. It's, it's Jim. It's Jim, Dave. Listen, yeah. I, I just needed to borrow some stuff tonight real quick. It won't take but a minute. I just need three loaves of bread. Just three loaves. Huh? You know what time it is? It's midnight, Jim. Midnight. I know it. I hate it so bad. But you know what? I've got company that came over and didn't know they were coming, and so I'm out of bread and don't have nothing to give them. I just need, huh? Back in the morning. I don't need it in the morning. I need it right now. So what I need you to do is just get up real quick and just give me three loaves of bread. You do. I saw you tonight when we were at your house when you was putting that bread up. I saw you put it in the pantry. You got three loaves over in the pantry. I just need you to get up real quick and go give them for me. Yeah. yeah. Now you see here what's happening. When he just told Jim to go home, there is a little thing here that you need to catch. See, what now, this has stepped over into another realm. He's, he's, Jim's kind of stepped over the line because the truth is when, when Dave tells Jim to go home and Jim keeps knocking, what's happening is Jim is actually trespassing, which is against the law. And the truth is, too, Dave could call the police and have Jim removed from his property. But here's the problem, and here's the blessing. Jim knows that they're friends, and because they are yeah, because they're friends, Jim knows Dave ain't going to call the police. Come on. So what he does is he just keeps knocking because he knows for friendship's sake, he can keep knocking. Come on. Hey, Dave. 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 Dave! I said go home. Oh no. No. See, now you've gotten up the whole house. The whole house upset. Now you've woken up my kids. Oh, now you see, that's just actually another little thing that you can notice in this story is because when you're not getting the answer that you're wanting and the door is not opening, what you do is you just keep awake knocking because when you wake up the kids a little bit, what you got to do with God is when you're not getting an answer, you start going and waking up some other intercessors and waking up some of other God's kids. You get some other people praying with you. You get some more people stirred up. It's all right to wake up the kids, honey. It's all right to wake up the kids. Kids. All you got to do is you just you just got to make up your mind. I'm not leaving the door. Come on, Dave. I ain't leaving, Dave. Come on. Hey, Dave. Dave. Hey, Dave. I can sit here all night, Dave. I'll be here when the sun comes up, Dave. He can do this because they're friends. You know that, don't you? Come on. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus said. This is how you're supposed to. Dave. You know what? And then Jesus said, if you pray long enough, if you pray long enough, 
<laughs> if you pray long enough, if you keep knocking long enough, come on, that's what happens. Oh, come on. If you keep praying long enough, if you keep knocking long enough, if you keep seeking long enough, come on, somebody, and you won't just have bread for you. Come on, y'all. You'll have bread for everybody else. Come on. Anybody want some bread? See, when you get your answer, it's not just enough for you. <laughs> it's enough for everybody else, too. Can you imagine that that's how Jesus said, I'm going to teach you how to pray, and it looks like that? That's what he said in the story. He keeps knocking. When the man's saying no, he keeps knocking. When the man says you're bothering the whole household, he keeps knocking. That's the whole illustration. And Jesus said if you won't get up just because you're his friend, if you'll just keep doing it, he'll get up just because of your shameless persistence. That's what you do in prayer. You just keep knocking. You keep praying. When it looks like it's days turning into months, turning into years, you just keep praying. You just keep knocking. You say, how long? How long, Karen? I tell you what Judah Jacob said. How long do you pray? Until. Come on, that's how long you pray. Shout until. Do you know that scares hell to death? Judy says it like this. What's the devil going to do with until? What's the devil going to do with until? He's going to give up. That's what I'll tell you. Oh, that's what he's going to do with it. You make up your mind. Oh, that's what Jesus said. I'm going to teach you how to pray and never give up. Oh, no, no, my night. Oh, you make up your mind. Oh, no, my night, no, my. Even if it means praying for your loved one all the way to the end of your days. And if you go to your grave without seeing the manifestation of your promise, then go to your grave believing. Because I'll tell you what happens. If you'll go to your grave believing, then your faith will still be working after you're gone. All God needs is some faith to still work with. Come on. If you go to your grave believing, then when you're gone, there's still going to be something moving. Those prayers are still going to be living. All those faith declarations of the word of God, still, because his word won't return void. It will never die. Oh, hallelujah. Look right here. Look at here. This is, in, amazingly, the hall of faith. Hebrews 11, he lists all these people, these people of faith, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. Then in verse 13, it says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and they welcomed it. That's what faith looks like. Faith looks like you can't destroy it in me. That's why Jesus said at the end of that verse, at the end of the story of Luke 18, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Faith is just something that somebody's got that just says, you're not going to take it from me. I'm going to stand until. I'm going to believe until. That's why Jesus looked at Peter and he said, oh, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, Peter. But I've been praying for you. And this is what he said. He didn't say, I've been praying for you that he won't do it. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I've been praying for you, so he's not going to. No. He just said, but Jesus, Jesus said, but Peter, I've been praying for you that your faith won't fail. In other words, you're going to be sifted. Your faith's going to be tried. It's not going to be easy. But you've got an intercessor praying for you right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. And you know what he's praying for you? That through the trial, your faith will not fail. That's why he said, I'm going to teach you to pray and never give up. 
Because when you can find faith like that, you can see mountains move. I want to close with this. When I read that illustration in the Bible, in Bob's book, I was so moved. It, it, when Lindsay was gone, it just changed my whole approach. It just changed my approach in prayer. It changed the way I, I just believed. I just determined. I just determined. I mean, I, I prayed like the woman in Luke 18. I just took it practically. I would literally say, in Luke 11, I would take it literally. I would just take it I, in my house, in my living room. I'd go to the front door of my living room, and I'd just be in there praying in the front door of my living room by myself in there, lifting my voice with, for, for my daughter. And every day, every day, every day, there wasn't a day in those years. I wasn't praying for her. So, But every day, I, w- I would stand there after I read that scripture, and I would stand at my front door literally doing like this. So he said, knock, I'm just going to knock. It's my front door, but in, in, in my spirit, it was heaven. I was knocking on heaven's door. In my mind, the way I saw it, I was knocking on the door of the throne room of God. Now, I know it's open and all that, but symbolically, what I needed, I thought the door was closed for it. I was going to stand there. So I'd do like this while I prayed in my front door. Now I'd stand there, I'd go, God, it's Karen. It's Karen, God. i got to have a miracle for Lindsay, God. God. I need the bread, God. I've got to have three loaves, God, for Lindsay. I need a loaf for healing, one for salvation, one for deliverance. I've got to have three loaves for my daughter, God. I'm not going to quit, God. i got to have, it's Karen. It's Karen, God. Just kept praying like that. One day, I was at the ramp. We were in the middle of worship. And we were in a conference. The the room was filled with young people, packed. And I was standing over there on the side, just worshiping with the kids. To be honest with you, I wasn't even thinking about in any way that illustration or anything. I was just literally in worship. So I was standing there with the kids, just praising God with a thousand young people on the ramp. Worshiping, worshiping. All of a sudden, I literally went into a vision. Suddenly, I see standing in front of me a door. And I looked at the door and I thought, what? What is this? I, can, I could see it as clearly as you're looking at me, maybe more. I look at this door and I'm thinking, what is this door? I'm looking, all of a sudden, the door simply opens and a hand reaches out and hands me three loaves of bread. I was so blown away. I, I remember what I did. I remember I was standing there and I went, oh, you're giving me the bread. You're giving me the bread. You're giving me the bread. It's going to come. It's, gonna, it's happening. You're giving me the bread. And when I reached to take it, all of a sudden, the door opened wide. And when the door opened wide, I was compelled. I stepped inside and through the door. And when I stepped in the door, I realized I was in a warehouse of bread. Unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. I could hardly even see the roof. It was all the way bread was lined on the walls with shelves. Indescribable. Nothing I've ever seen compared. A warehouse of nothing but bread. And all of a sudden, I'm looking around in this warehouse of bread. And I heard the voice speak to me. And he said, you just want three? (laughs) Come on, you just want three? I remember that day I said, no, God. If I could ask, I'll take them all. I need them for a generation of young people that I want to reach for the kingdom of God. I need them all, God. I need all the bread. I need it all, God. Oh, come on. Stand to your feet this afternoon and those of you at home watching. Oh, no, my, no, no. I believe the Lord is saying to you that are watching and those of you in this room, don't ask a small thing of a great God. You just want three? Now, he cares about what you're asking for, and he will give that. 
But remember, he's a God that can do exceeding abundantly above what you ask or think or dream or imagine. Remember, when he gives you his answer, he will give you the answer, but he will also multiply that answer that you can turn around and feed a generation. You can feed the people in the sphere of your influence. And with what God does to answer your prayers, when people see you praying and they see him answering, they're going to know there's a God and he's going to receive great glory from your faith and from your prayers. Let's lift our hands to the Lord right now all over this room. Father, we humble ourselves before you now, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for this privilege that you allow us to come before you with boldness. Wow. Thank you that you've taken those of us who were not worthy and made us worthy with your own blood to approach you and know you and ask of you and receive from you. Thank you, Father, that you speak to us and we hear your voice. Thank you, God, that you are faithful to keep the promises you make. You have never failed one and you never will. Lord, over all of these that are listening and have listened to this teaching over the last few days, I pray in Jesus' name their faith is increased. I pray, God, in Jesus' name that they will pray now with new faith and strength and see the manifestation of the promises you've given them. Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, today we are going to go home and we're going to knock we're going to seek, we're going to ask of you, and we're going to receive. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, we will see miracles, prodigals coming home, families healed and restored. Oh, hallelujah. Financial provision manifested. Marriages healed completely. Bodies healed healed. God, it is time to see the manifestation of physical healings like never before. We know it is your will, so we are asking knowing that you hear us and will answer us. Greater manifestations, God. Lord, get through us. Get through us as conduits of faith. Get through us. I pray that right now. Would you pray that with me? Say, Lord, get through me. Get through me. Get through me. God, get through me. Come on, Lord, don't let there be anything in me that's hindering it. Don't let there be any sin. Come on, agree with me. No unbelief in me, God. No unforgiveness toward other people in me. Get through me. Get through me. I want to be a conduit of faith. I don't want something stopping it up, stopping up this pipe. I want you to be able to get through me, God, to change my world. No, 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 my, in the name of Jesus, to change my city, to change my nation, my family. God, I give you praise. And Lord, ultimately, at the end of all things, we want to return to you as sons and daughters, but especially as friends of God. Thank you, Jesus. When we stand before you, Lord, we want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant.